Good morning. My sermon today is entitled, Spiritual Formation in Disciple Making. And we're going to start by reading two passages out. The first of those is Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. You are the light of the world, a city set on the hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under the basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And now, uh, if you would turn with me to Philippians chapter 1, verses uh, 3 to 11. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for for you all making my prayer with joy, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you, because I hold you, I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn uh, for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer for you that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. I want to start by asking a question. What is man's ultimate purpose in this life? Over the centuries, uh, one answer that has been given is that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him fully. The pursuit of this goal is what it means to be a disciple of Christ. One of the early fathers of the faith, Augustine of Hippo, said this well when he stated, Almighty God, in whom we live and move and have our being, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Grant us purity of heart and strength of purpose, that no selfish passion may hinder us from knowing your will, no weakness from doing it, but that in your light we may see clearly, and that in your service we may find our perfect freedom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Augustine knew that once we desire to glorify God with our whole being, we will find the perfect peace and rest that only a relationship with God can provide. Today I want to focus on a principal component of the growth of this relationship with God, and that is spiritual formation and the discipleship lifestyle that should come out of it. Now, Spiritual formation and its practices are often lost in the era of instant gratification and quick solutions, for it calls the believer to take up the cross of Christ and follow him with all his heart, mind, body, and soul. All too often, one hears of Christians that are saved, but... Th- but what is lost is the message of what they are saved to. Christians are saved to a thriving and fruitful relationship with their Lord and Savior, through which they can have the confidence and firm foundation of their faith. This faith, as it forms, will then grow into a desire to evangelize and to disciple others so that they might hear and know of the glory of God. Sadly, spiritual formation is often held at an arm's length because it calls men to examine themselves before the Lord. It calls for sacrifice, a denying of oneself. 
It is not a type of pleasant mass market Christianity that tells us about health, wealth, and prosperity, but rather it is one of selfless abandon. The process of spiritual formation acknowledges that man is saved uh, and redeemed of his sins, but it holds that the first salvation experience is only the first step on the spiritual journey. Spiritual formation is a deliberate effort to surrender more and more to Christ each and every day. It is putting into practice the, pra the habits of prayer and worship, fasting, repentance, and obedience to God. It is that journey through which a sinner is slowly transformed and sanctified to be more and more like our ultimate model, Jesus Christ himself. When one first becomes a Christian, they have to come to terms with the fact that they are a sinner. We are all sinners, and we need redemption. Man has been stuck in the mire of their own great tragedy. The Bible tells us that we were created to walk in perfect harmony with God, yet we've spurned the glory of him so that we could attempt to take his place in creation. Foolishly, man was tempted to believe that he too could be like God. The act of rebelling against God by Adam and Eve in the garden was the act where the two most perfect people who were given every opportunity to love the Lord chose to push back the hand of their creator and rebel against their God-ordained purpose to glorify him. This rebellious spirit was passed down from Adam and lies in the heart of every man. We long to rebel, to destroy, and to hate the very God who gave us life. Yet despite this rebellious nature, we are called by Jesus to love God with everything that we are. For Matthew 22, 37 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. This command to love God is an impossible command. For no man ever to walk the earth truly love the Lord with all of his heart, ex except the incarnate Son of God. This is where the need for surrender begins. This is, this is where man, as part of his spiritual formation, must realize that there is nothing that he can do within his own power that will enable him to truly love God. Instead, he must surrender his life to the Spirit of Christ, allowing his nature to be transformed and empowered so that he may toss aside the nature of Adam and live in the Spirit of Christ. For Romans 8, 1-11 says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law uh, weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit." For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The question is, how does living by the Spirit start? Well, the first step is repentance. Repentance has two key aspects, and it is the first step on the journey of spiritual formation. These two aspects are first, the acknowledgement of man's place before God, and second, the 
absolute surrender of man to God's sovereign will in his life. As Paul writes in Ephesians 1 verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. These two components combine to create a declaration that reverses the attitude, I will be like God, to I will serve my God. From this repentance, the new believer becomes a son or daughter in the kingdom of light who has been rescued out of the dominion of darkness. They are given new life, and in this new life, rediscover what man's original purpose on this earth was. With salvation and repentance comes the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which fills up the believer to transform their minds from the desires of the flesh to the desires and the things of God. This indwelling allows the Christian to walk by the Spirit so that they will not carry out the desires of the flesh. This is the promise given to Israel when God said, I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. Now, carefully observing God's ordinances is the next step of spiritual formation. Man cannot, out of his own will, obey God. For to be perfect is impossible for man. But through the washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit, each day he can be formed anew to become more and more like Christ, which should be the disciple's chief desire. Why should one desire to be like Christ? For this reason, nobody on earth glorified God more than Jesus Christ. He was the perfect sacrifice who entirely submitted himself to the will of God. He was the perfect, for, uh, for Hebrews 10, 14 states, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 9 states, Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, uh, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself to becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, he has been highly exalted and, bes and, and, and bestowed on him is the name that is above every other name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and in, and in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, on the cross, all the attributes of God were perfectly expressed. His justice, his mercy, his grace, and his love epitomized in a single moment. The cross was the truest act of worship in the history of humanity. For it was the selfless expression of the sinless incarnate Son of God who submitted himself fully under the wrath of God for the sake of those who did not deserve life. For this reason, just as Christ died, Christian disciples are also called to die. This is why Jesus stated, If anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. This is the true grace of Christ. This is discipleship, and Bonhoeffer writes, The cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering, which every man must experience, is a call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is the dying of the old man, which is the result of his encounter with Christ. 
As we embark upon the discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. Thus it begins, the cross is not a terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Unfortunately, as we discussed earlier, it is all too common to call a believer to Christ, yet fail to beckon them to the spiritual journey of transformation by grace. The calling to pick one's up, up one's cross is an illustration for a total surrender to the things of God. It is saying by action and word, not my will, but yours be done. This is what it means to love God. For as man lives out his created purpose to glorify God, he displays his love toward God. This love is not the cheap love of a movie actor on a screen who says, I love you with ev to every woman he finds beautiful. But it is the love of commitment that is rooted, steadfast, and faithful. We love, though, because he first loved us. The truth is that God desired a relationship with us while we weren't worthy. For Romans 5.8 says, but God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It is the truth of God who stepped down from heaven to where men dwell so that he might save them from their sins. It is the greatest love story ever written. Thus, Christians venture to love the Lord our God with all our heart by imitating Christ and doing those things that are right in the Lord's eyes through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The next step in the spiritual journey is regeneration. For although one may be repentant. We must keep in mind that evil will not stand by. For the world, the flesh, and the devil all lie in wait for the believer to rely on his own strength instead of the strength of Christ. This is so that we may find him, in a, it, it, the devil may find him in a moment of weakness and cause him to betray the Lord who has saved the Christian. Peter tells believers to be serious, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for those that he may devour. The question arises then, how can one be serious and alert? By the practice of spiritual disciplines. Prayer and communion with God is beneficial to continually remind the Christian of his need and dependency on God. Fasting is another uh, spiritual discipline. It helps the Christian enable or and enables the Christian to realize that worldly desires, even those for food, and water are nothing compared to the richness that is found in Christ Jesus. For this is what Isaiah speaks of in Isaiah 58 when he states, Is such the fast that I choose a day for the person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to sprinkle sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and an acceptable to the, acceptable to the Lord? Is not this fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and to bring the homeless into your house when you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then, Shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing spring up like uh, spring up speedily? Your righteousness shall go out before you. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and He will say, "Here I am." Finally, another 
important spiritual discipline is the study and the word of God which continually transforms and renews the mind of the believer so they become one in their thinking with Christ. David writes of this study of the word in Psalm 119, 19 to 16, or 9 to 16. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare your rules of my mo in my mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Now, there are many other spiritual disciplines that may be undertaken. But here is my primary point, that, and that is that a designated effort should be undertaken on the part of the Christian to draw near to God. All too often, Christians let their guard down when they feel spiritually secure. They are filled with the Holy Spirit, yet they do not fill up to overflowing because they do not spend time with God or walk with him continually in prayer, asking for his daily guidance and empowerment. They may try to do things on their own strength and let their guard down for a little too long. Bit by bit, evil finds a soft spot in their armor and shoots a fiery dart straight to the exposed area. Constant communion with God and reliance on him for all spiritual strength helps the believer to maintain their armor so that they are knowledgeable of their own shortcomings and practice of spiritual discipline puts the Christian weakness, the Christian's weakness in God's hands so that he may protect them from evil. Now, as this regeneration and focus on the spiritual disciplines becomes evident in the Christian's life, bit by bit, they will become transformed. They will learn to love God more and more by continu continually relying on him and being obedient to his statutes. Eventually, this transformation will lead to a reorientating of priorities. The Christian will move from thinking about themselves and their faith to looking outside themselves. They notice that they have received the greatest gift into their lives. It is one of eternal redemption and salvation for one that was dead in sin now has been raised up by the power of Christ. They start to see the message of love and salvation that has been given by the creator of the universe and, the, and that this message is a free and open invitation and the proclamation of the message of the cross is an act of worship to God. This, then, is the end goal of Christian spiritual formation. The Christian who is constant in the practices of spiritual formation and continually surrendered to the Spirit of Christ cannot help but be overwhelmed with a desire to be like Jesus and follow his final command to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. The process of spiritual transformation starts with a decision, and then it turns to transformation, which moves to multiplication in the church and ends with the glorification of God. That is, for the believer repents, is transformed, and then through the teaching of the word and the renewal of their mind by the work of the Holy Spirit, they come to realize a love for their fellow man and desire to see God glorified among them. Now, all too often, there is the excuse given that people don't listen or people don't want to hear about my faith. But the proclamation of the gospel is a commanded act of worship to the glorification of God. 
It is not an option. It is a command. And so the transformed Christian must be obedient to share their faith. Whether people listen or not is irrelevant. For it is not the Christian and not our words that transform the hearts and minds of other men, but rather it is the Spirit of Christ that is working within their hearts, causing them to see the beauty of the gospel. God invites Christians to partake in his plan of salvation so that they might walk hand in hand with him in relationship, not leaning on themselves, each, but each and every day realizing more and more what it is to rest in Christ and to let his spirit work through them. The call to evangelize and to make disciples is the outgrowth of Christian maturity and spiritual formation. And the mature Christian is one who realizes the deep and vast love that God has for all of mankind. It is at this point where the believer truly rests in God, trusting the Spirit of God and the knowledge of his word to guide their heart and lives so that the Lord would be glorified. It is the selfless desires to see others enter this same rest in God that they themselves enjoy. And it is realizing that nothing can be done out of man's own strength, but rather that all things are done and accomplished by God's will through his power and to his glory. God is God. We are not. And the more we toil on our own, the more restless that we will become. But when we submit to the yoke of Jesus Christ and come into his sweet presence... We will, we will find that we develop both a love for God and a love for man. And in doing so, become disciples and disciple others to the glory of God. Paul wrote, For what we proclaim is not, our, is not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And as we shine the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, we will find rest. For this is what Jesus meant when he stated, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. All of you, take my yoke and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that you have given us Lord, we pray that we might be disciples of your word and press into you, hungry for your presence as we desire to become more like Christ. Lord, help us to desire to pray, to fast, to feast on your word so that we would come to know you more and more each day. Then let us, out of that foundation, come to bring, the found, to bring the gospel to our Jerusalem and the whole world for the purpose of your honor and glory. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.